Welcome everyone to tonight's webinar on establishing dry land pastures. So I'm Laura Lake, the Extension Manager down here in Central Otago. And we've also got Maria Shanks, who's behind the scenes pushing the buttons, the Extension Manager up in Hamilton. So tonight could have not been done without our supporters. So we've had Seed Force and Farmlands help us out with advertising and getting this, getting this webinar going. And so we've got Hugh Murray from Farmlands joining us and Natalie Stoker from Seedforce, so welcome you two. I'm just going to pass on to them to introduce themselves for a couple of seconds, so Natalie I'll throw over to you. Great, thanks Laura. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Natalie Stoker from Seedforce and I'm a member of the technical extension team. Um, Seedforce is really happy that these webinars are happening both this week and next week um, as we have a key focus in the dry land pasture space. Um, so we certainly know the need for having uh, dry land pastures that work in a range of dry and extreme environments, uh, particularly when times get tough. Um, so you might know us for products like Coxfoot and Subclover or, or Lucerne. Um, we'd certainly like to encourage you to ask any questions this evening. Um, whatever they are, it's a great opportunity to use Derek and have him answer the questions around establishing any dry land pastures, um, the little intricacies or how to get a system going. So I really like to encourage that. Um, and thanks again to Beef and Lamb and Derek uh, for coming and bringing this uh, webinar together. Thanks a lot. All right, thank you very much. And so I'll just throw it over to Hugh. Uh, yeah, evening. Um, my name is Hugh Murray. I'm the Farmlands Agronomist for Otago. Uh, on behalf of Farmlands, I'd like to say thank you to Laura and Beef and Land for organising the webinar. Uh, being in, based in central Otago, dry land farming's always pretty close to my heart and a big chunk of my job. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, Professor Moot for giving up his time and knowledge this evening. It's always well worth the listen, uh, especially when he's talking about um, Lucy and another dry land legumes. Uh, a quick plug for farmlands, um, if any listeners would like to talk agronomy options or plans for the upcoming season, we have nine regionally based agronomists and numerous TFOs throughout the patch with strong agronomy backgrounds always willing to help. So just give us a call. So thank you. Thank you very much Hugh, we appreciate you two being on the call tonight and, and going forward with some more webinars. So um, we might as well jump into what we're here for, which is establishing dry land pastures. So traditionally, New Zealand's history of plant science was around ryegrass and white clover. But as the sheep and beef herd ended up higher and drier, so they say, the limitations of these pastures become apparent. This research to Lucerne and other dry land pastures with Professor Derek Moot leading the way in helping farmers learn more about these species. As you all know, Derek is with us tonight to answer your questions regarding establishment of dry land pastures. And we would like to keep the questions around establishment. Um, we are having another webinar this time next week, and that's when we'll focus on the management a bit more. Um, so I'll just flick over to you, Derek. So Derek is going to just in, say hello, and then we, he's going to put up a short presentation, and then we'll just get straight into Q&As. Great. Right. Thanks, Laura, and um, thank you all for taking the time to join us this evening. I am keen on um, talking about establishment, but I'm also keen on answering questions. So I'd really encourage you, if you haven't used a chat box before, have a go um, and put your, your chat box question in, and then we can um, spend most of the time answering questions rather than just listening to me uh, talking in a presentation, which, which generally I do as a lecture. So what I wanted to do is um, actually just go through some of the reasons that we might be interested in um, dry land pastures. So, so that we're all talking about the same thing and we're all working off the same page. So um, making sure that we know what the drivers of animal production are, the drivers of plant production, some establishment around lucerne, a little bit about subclover and what you should be doing now or thinking about now with subclover. And then essentially just thinking about the whole role of um, legumes for dryland systems. So I use this slide quite a bit because it's really um, a summary of what I encounter at my dryland farm at Ashley Dean at Lincoln. And effectively, um, this photo is the 9th of January, but one year it was the 9th of November. And so what I try and say is we actually, if we've got a 5 kg birth weight and a 35 kg um, target weight, 
we've actually got to grow animals 300 grams per head per day in 100 days to have them achieve those targets. If we don't do that and it gets dry, then we've got store lambs, lower value, and we've got um, ewes that are often losing condition. So growing the animals, particularly during that lactation period, is really, really important. So knowing that we've got to do 300 grams per head per day, we've then got to understand what are the species that can do that for us from um, birth to weaning, hopefully. And if we get um, a very good summary of that, that sort of information, that comes from this graph here, which is a, a beef and lamb graph. And effectively what it says is, you can follow my lines here, um, to do 300 grams per head per day, you have to be consuming feed that's got an ME of 12. And that's basically mostly clover, pasture, good quality lucerne, and then some of our specialist crops that we might put in. But our average ryegrass growing pasture um, with an ME of about 10 and a half, we'll grow animals at about 150 um, grams per head per day. Mother's milk here, the ewe milk, will do more than that 300 grams per head per day. And what we're talking about here is trying to do this on average from birth to weaning, um, because at the beginning of lactation, you might find the animals are doing more than that. As they're on mum's milk, they could actually be doing closer to that 400. But as they get bigger, it becomes harder to keep them doing uh, more than about 300 grams per head per day. And certainly with all the work I've done at Lincoln, most of it's been with Coopworths, um, twins, if we can do 300, 330 during that period, then we're feeling like we've achieved um, quite well. So legume is what we're really interested in, but something to keep you in mind when you're dealing with legume-based pastures is you can have high clover, but if you haven't got enough of it, then actually that doesn't help either. So we must have access to feed as well as good quality feed. So I use this graph to sort of illustrate that point <clears throat> what this graph is saying, if you can see the blue line down here, um, is if we've got sheep and we've got an ME, that pasture has got an ME of 9.5, then if there's not much available, so let's say there's less than 2,000 kilos available, we can never do more than 100 grams per head per day. That's the limitation, even when we go up to having three and a half tonnes available, we're going to do 100 grams per head per day. If we can shift that up to um, this line here, by having a higher um, value feed, a sheep with an ME of 11 and a half, then actually that's when we can start to achieve um, 250 grams per head per day and more. But you've got to have access to feed to be able to do that. So this is just a stylized um, diagram from the QGRAZE manual that AgriSearch put together a number of years ago. I think it's a really good illustration of what ME does, so high quality pasture, or low quality versus high quality pasture. And the graph here also has cattle on it. So those of you that are struggling to do more than a kilo a day, um, it's probably because the ME of your feed is sitting around nine and a half, compared with um, when you get it up to being 11 and a half, then obviously your cattle can grow um, quicker as well. So quality and quantity are important. And it's sort of why I um, really like the Lucerne system and for those of you that are new, you may not understand that I really like the Lucerne system, but I do. And that's because it actually, by default, gets us to do that. It gets us to give the animals about two and a half to three tonnes of feed when they go in to eat, and then they leave behind about a tonne of dry matter afterwards. So they're actually going into really good allowances. And perhaps the best advantage we're seeing out of um, these lucerne-based systems is, yeah, our lambs are doing about 300, 330, sometimes a bit more, um, but the ewes are maintaining their condition during that lactation period. And that's a key in a dryland system because then the ewes are not losing weight, so we're not having to put that weight back on them afterwards. So maintaining weight on the ewes is a pretty important um, component. So the other thing is that's sort of what makes animals grow, but what makes plants grow? And this is the very simplest experiment I ever did at Lincoln. And if you've heard me speak before, you will have heard me refer to this. Basically, I took a dry land pasture, imagine it's the Canterbury Plains and it's completely dry. And to this plot, I added all the water it wanted. And to this plot, I added all the nitrogen. And to this plot, I did a dairy farm and I gave it all the water and all the nitrogen. What I want to focus on today are basically this treatment here that had all the water. So this is when you've got your dry land farm in central Otago and someone says to you, um, actually we can put irrigation on it. So that's, that's the irrigation response. And this one is your dry land pasture when you go, actually I'm still dry, 
haven't got any access to irrigation, how do I, um, how do I manage with nitrogen? So let's just have a look at what happened with those treatments. Here's a typical dry land pasture production curve, um, a, a bump here in the spring, and then we get dry through the summer, and really we're growing for about three months, and that's that, th that 100 days I was talking about. So we've got September, October, November, um, and that's about it. By December, it could all be gone. And certainly January and February, we don't expect to be growing very much at all. So that's a typical pasture production curve off, the, off that experiment that I just showed you a photo of. Here's what happened when we added irrigation. And I want you to note two things here, which shouldn't surprise you. The first is, if you water it, you don't get any more growth during the spring. Well, that shouldn't be a surprise because actually when we water in the spring, there's no point because we've already got moisture. Um, and so the real benefit comes with irrigation in that dry period but we've only gone from 6.3 tonnes to 9.8 tonnes. So you've spent all your money on a centre pivot irrigator and you've gone from 6.3 to about 10 tonnes of dry matter. That's when we just added water. Just adding water doesn't deal with the issue for pastures. The issue is nitrogen. So here is what happened when we just added nitrogen. So that's the treatment that looked really dry in the summer because the photo I was showing you was in here. But you can see we've got much higher pasture growth rates when we've got water available. One of the beauties of New Zealand is we generally start the spring with the bucket full with plenty of water, soil moisture. And if we have nitrogen in the system, then we can move from producing 50 kilos of dry matter per hectare per day in October to 90. And then when we get a little bit of um, rainfall, if we've got nitrogen, the dry land pasture didn't respond, but the one that had end did respond. And then in the autumn, where we've got a bit of moisture come through here, then we've also got a big increase in the, the autumn growth as well. So this is, this is actually quite cheap compared with a centre pivot irrigator. Remember my centre pivot went from six to 10. This one's going from six to 16. And that's really what got me interested in trying to say, well, I don't actually want all dry land farmers to go out and use nitrogen fertiliser. Could we do it with legumes? Because all plants are nitrogen deficient all the time, except legumes. And it's a truth that we sort of um, have forgotten. We, we want to grow a whole lot of plants, but we don't realise that to grow plants, you have to have nitrogen in the system. You can put a lot of mulch around your garden, but eventually it has to break down to, to release the nitrogen as nitrate for the plants to take it up. And I just thought I'd show some data that we're collecting out of our um, Hill Country Futures programme that Beef and Lamb is supporting us with. And here's um, some data from Banks Peninsula, it's hills, and, um, but it's got some flat tops. So here's the farmer's unimproved, it's about that six and a half tonnes that I was showing you. And then there's what the lucerne did. So we did actually get from that six to 14, this is um, this year. So you can see the big difference that having the nitrogen in the system by having the lucerne has done for that farm. So instead of growing six tonnes, 6.4 tonnes, he's actually growing 14 which is pretty much what I showed you we did theoretically with an experiment. So this data is showing us that we can do it on farm. And that's why I'm so interested in the legumes is because they give us that nitrogen and that nitrogen gives us high quality feed and the high quality feed gives us high animal growth rates. And um, we can't get past that. So knowing which legume and how to manage it is pretty important. So tonight's focus is on pasture renewal. So I thought I'd just do some um, generic pasture renewal things. Um, we should all have done a soil test if we're looking to sow a lucerne stand or a pasture this spring. You want to do that in the autumn. Generally we try and soil test in the autumn because we get our most stable result. Um, sulfur levels tend to go up and down with moisture so it's better to do it in the autumn when we have our most stable weather. And we really need to think about soil fertility as trying to assist the legume to establish. So in most cases we won't be wanting to put nitrogen down. We might if we're doing some direct drilling and we can pick up on that um, in some of the questions if people are interested. But in general, we don't tend to use nitrogen at establishment, except maybe if we're direct drilling. Phosphorus is pretty important. And the reason that I focus on phosphorus as being important at establishment is because for the legume, the phosphorus provides the energy source. It's the energy the plant needs for photosynthesis, but it's the energy source for nitrogen fixation as well. So the first six weeks or so of a plant's growth are really important to have some phosphorus available to it. 
So it's important that we have phosphorus available. Um, potassium, most of our soils actually have sufficient potassium in them, unless you've got a potassium deficiency or you've been cut and carrying, removing a lot of herbage off a paddock uh, as hay or baleage, um, and then you're removing a lot of potassium in that. So then you'd, you'd be wanting to put potassium in. But our soil test will give us a good idea of phosphorus and um, potassium. Sulfur, um, we tend to forget about sulfur because we put superphosphate on and actually our super, superphosphate provides that sulfur. But a lot of our hill country actually has adequate phosphorus and is short of sulfur. And that's why you might be encouraged to use products such as extra sulfur super. Um, our hill country where it's harder to apply fertilizer, it's really the sulfur that becomes limiting in a lot of those areas, particularly when you get into wetter areas um, and, and for the guys that are on the, the west part of the country. The other one to keep an eye on if you haven't ever put any molybdenum on is it's a trace element. So here we were talking phosphorus, we're talking kilograms of phosphorus per hectare. Here we're talking sodium molybdate and it's grams per hectare. So just a very small amount of molybdenum um, is pretty important. The molybdenum is really useful for the nitrogen fixation. And again, if you're thinking hill country, um, often as we grow plants, the pH drops, and part of the consequence of that is molybdenum becomes less available. And so putting some molybdenum on actually makes that available. And I've just got a couple of examples of that happening for us on farm. This is an experiment I did with a student, and um, what we've got here is an Olsen P of 20, and we've got actually a sweet corn crop growing here, and you can see the sweet corn. But the weed in between is actually mostly subclover. And so he was devastated by the, um, the weeds that came up in his paddock, and so he went out and sprayed them, and that's why it looks a bit dead. There's a bit of stalk spill and a few other things in there. But the majority of the weed actually growing in those rows was subclover with an Olsen P of 20. Because what we'd done is taken a paddock that had an Olsen P of less than six and put some fertilizer on it. And you can see between the rows, I'll just go back to that other one. Between the rows here, we've got virtually no subclover. So the legume really needed that phosphorus at establishment. Interestingly, so did the sweet corn. All of the differences in the yield at the end of the season were related to the first six weeks of growth. You can see the size of the plants and they look a bit anemic here. They haven't got their photosynthesis system going very well and you can see that as being pale. And that's the lack of phosphorus in the system. Compared with these ones, which are the same age, so it's taken on the same day. I was quite excited to take these experiments, these photos, he wasn't very happy at all. But a really good illustration of the importance of phosphorus at establishment. Now why I emphasize establishment is because once the plant's growing, actually its root system grows out to the phosphorus and there's generally enough of phosphorus available to them. And that's why this crop um, didn't have any problems from then on because it grows a, a decent amount of root and so it had access to phosphorus. Because plants have to grow their, their roots to phosphorus because phosphorus is bound to the soil. That's why we try and avoid sediment loss in farming because it's phosphorus that we're losing. Whereas sulfur and nitrogen, because they're negatively charged, they drain or leach from the system and they're in the water solution. So when the plant draws water to them, they draw sulfur and they draw nitrogen. But phosphorus, they have to grow to it. And that's the difference in why phosphorus is important at establishment. Um, this was an experiment we did on a, a farm in southern Wairapa and we basically put some fertilizer strips down and some of them were molybdenum, and you can basically see the molybdenum response here on this farm. Um, and I didn't have the close up, but effectively, it's really difficult to know if you've got a molybdenum deficiency, particularly on hill country. It's hard to do a herbage test, you can't do a soil test. So what we did here was actually just get a watering can and put some watering can across some areas that had some sub, um, sub clover and got a huge response to it. So important to think about that if you're top dressing hill country and your clover leaves are looking a little bit small, it might be worth talking to your fert rep about having um, some molybdenum in your mix. Uh, this farmer has, has said he hadn't put any on for 20 years and so he got quite a response for his um, sub clover in this case. So just some particulars around um, lucerne. We're looking for deep free draining soils, pH of six to seven. I know a lot of stands get put in around five, eight. But part of lifting that pH is to make molybdenum available. So that's why we put lime on, 
because it makes the molybdenum available, and our ryegrass white clover fertility. So there's nothing special about establishing a lucerne stand. If you haven't done lucerne before, you haven't had it in a paddock, you really need to have inoculation or the bacteria that will allow nitrogen fixation to happen. And like all herbage species, we don't want to sow them too deep. So we're not putting them down at 50 mils like we would a wheat plant, just 10 mils, 25 mils, bare or coated seed about 10 kilos. You can spring or autumn sow. Um, my preference is for spring sowing, which is why we're having this webinar now, so people can think about it. Um, I've seen very good cultivated and direct drilled stands, so you can do either. And certainly um, if you're in a really dry environment, after a fallow is pretty important. And so for lucerne, something like a brassica cop, crop works quite well as long as the fertilizer and herbicides haven't been a problem, particularly the herbicides, because your brassica crop you tend to feed off early in the winter, which then allows you to get some rain for them, build up some soil moisture before you go in with your lucerne stand. Um, and here's an example of direct drilling, and the lucerne is coming up through that. That's been double sprayed, so that was a, an example from Central Otago, where the brown top and um, Danthonia was sprayed off in the autumn and then fallowed through the winter, sprayed again before drilling, and then the seed had phosphorus put below it. In this case, there was probably some DAP went with it, okay? So that's the lucerne, very briefly, and just a couple of minutes on subclover as our other main dryland species. Um, why subclover? This graph is, again, part of the data we're getting from, um, from our Hill Country Futures project. And it illustrates it quite nicely. We've got red clover and white clover as these two down here. Here's our perennial legumes. But in that lactation period in early spring, this is Wujanalip and this is Antis, just two large leaf subclovers. And they've produced about five tonne of dry matter by the time the white clover, again a big leaf kopu, has produced about 2.5 and the red clover isn't yet getting out of bed. So it's the timing of the subclover that we're interested in because it's early spring feed. And if we're looking for feed at lactation, then that's what we're really after. So that's why we're interested in trying to get subclover to complement a lucerne based system, pretty important. Um, so what do you need to do is in a dry land situation, at this time of the year, you shouldn't be thinking about drilling subclover because it really needs to be autumn established. So what you've got to do at this time of the year it, well, not even now, is, is in September, is go out and walk around your paddocks. Go and see, is there subclover in the paddock? Because if there is and you've got an acceptable population, then you want to look to try and manage that population to increase the amount of clover that you've got. So um, managing it, if, you've, if you're walking up a hillside and every second step you step on a subclover plant, that's probably enough if you do the management properly to increase that subclover content. If there's fewer than that, um, then you really want to be thinking about planning to put some subclover in next autumn. So this is an example of a hillside that we went to. Um, there were about 15 subclover plants per meter squared, and you can see them here. These are all subclover plants here within a meter. And you'd think there's no subclover on this paddock at all. But all we did, you think, you know, it's a thatch of grass and it's not, not going to come through. Actually, all we did was graze with cattle and allow it to set some seed, and we built up the subclover on that um, paddock quite nicely. So if you've got a paddock that's looking like that, you can actually just use grazing management to increase your subclover content, because it'll produce these things called runners. This is a runner, and this is running out. You can see that flower here at the end of the runner. Now subclover is self-fertile, so um, it will produce its own seed, and this is what it becomes. That's a burr forming and there's another one, and there's another one, and there'll be some back here as well. And it's subclover because it's sub under to rain the ground, and it's burying those seeds under the ground for next year. So one of those runners, if you manage it properly, can actually run about a metre um, if you let it go for, from flowering. The problem is that our sheep are not stupid, despite what people say, and the sheep come along, and they eat these, and they know there's a packet of lollies buried at the bottom here. Whereas cattle, they're a little less subtle, and they a little more subtle. They just go along and take the top off. And so you can keep some cattle in a subclover paddock to control the grass um, in, say, November next year if you're trying to get subclover to set seed. Don't keep sheep in the paddock because they will, they will basically chew this whole thing out. 
So you can't really increase your um, subclover content if you've got a lot of sheep on the property. You need to identify a block or a paddock and try and increase it on that. So just to finish, um, all plants are nitrogen deficient all the time, except legumes. We need nitrogen to make plants grow and we need quantity and quality to get animals to grow. The legume growth is seasonal, so we shouldn't be thinking that the subclover paddocks are going to do the same as the lucerne paddock. They're doing things at different times and it's that complementary nature of them that's really important. And, and getting that quality right and grazing it right we'll deal with next week. Um, management of the legumes trumps genetics. And I, I like putting this one down because I talk to my animal science colleagues and they're all interested in you know, wh which ram have they bought and how much has it been sold for. And they actually say to me, you know what, about 85% of the live weight gain is, is feeding, the last 15 is breeding. And I go, yep, that's right. And the feeding is really important. So if we can get um, our fertilizer right, we can get our seed right, we can get our stock management right and our subdivision, then we can get our legumes to help us in the system. And uh, that's really what we're, what the, this webinar is about. So that's my short introduction, um, Laura, I'll leave it at that. Was that more than 10? Did I go over? Just slightly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, that's all good. We will still finish on time. So thank you very much for that, Derek. Uh, we have had quite a few questions come through. So thank you very much, everyone, for this. Um, and we've also had some that were pretty uh, came in with the registrations too. So I might try start with um, just some general ones um, and then sort of try move on to the lucerne and um, sub if I can, if I can sort them out. So um, first question, so when it's dry for seed establishment, do we wait for moisture to drill into or do we drill and hope that it will come? And does this change for different pasture species? It's a really good question and, and, and uh, yes, it changes for different pasture species. So I'm hoping that if we're talking about that, we're really talking about subclover and autumn establishment because that's when we're most likely to be dry. And I actually had an experiment that I had with a student who um, was doing her masters and we drilled in the, second, the first week of March and we didn't get any rain until the first week of June, Queen's birthday weekend. And that seed all struck. Okay, so that was subclover that we just direct drilled in. So what I was advising this autumn to a lot of the guys hit with drought was just to drill subclover into the ground because it will strike regardless um, when the rain comes. Whereas lucerne, we wouldn't expect that to happen and we wouldn't want to be doing the lucerne in the autumn. Generally, we'd be doing it in the spring and making sure that we have got moisture. So the lucerne is going to be less likely to strike and you get a much more uneven strike. But I can answer that quite confidently from that experience of having a student come in my office every week and go, is this going to strike? Is this going to strike? And it struck in June. Okay, that's perfect. Um, so that sort of leads me on to just, um, we've got a question around why do you recommend spring sowing for looser and more around that water, obviously, but is there any more elements to add into that day length, etc.? Yes, so um, lucerne is a long day plant, so it actually spends a lot of its time in the autumn not being very productive. And um, so my suggestion, unless you've got really specific requirements, and I talk sometimes, um, if you've got sand country in the Hawke's Bay, those sorts of very dry areas, you might, and you've got a warm winter, then you might get away with autumn sowing lucerne. But in general, what you're looking for is to have the moisture in the ground that the lucerne can take advantage of in the spring. So that's why I like it to follow um, a brassica crop and generally a brassica because you take it out early. Farmers are notorious for Italian ryegrass. They'll just keep getting another graze and another graze. And I just want to get a last green pick, but you can only use the water once. And so if you've used the water up to grow the Italian ryegrass, when the, you then drill the, the lucerne there's no water for it. So you've got to think about what you're trying to do with that lucerne and spring sowing is um, optimum. The other thing is that lucerne spends a lot of its time growing roots when you first establish it. It wants to grow five tons of biomass below ground. And the quicker it can do that, the quicker it'll start to be productive above ground. So spring is the time it will do that. 
what I would suggest is for anyone that's in a, a South Island environment, for example, just spring sow. Autumn sowing, you'll end up with weeds, you'll end up with, um, yeah, a whole lot of stuff you don't want. You're better off actually then just putting in an Italian or a cereal or something, take it out early and spring sow. Okay, that's awesome. So thank you very much. This will lead on to um, different soils and what soils are not suitable for establishing lucerne. Okay. Um, so soils that, look, when I was taught as a student, we were told free draining, and I put that on my slide as well, free draining deep soils. But actually we're now establishing it on clay soils and soils that we never thought we should. The, the biggest thing we don't want to do is put it in areas that would, where water sits in the winter for two or three weeks. So water that gets bogged that sits on a lucerne plant takes the oxygen from around the root and basically the roots rot. Now it's not just lucerne, it's red clover, it's chicory, all the taprooted species lose their taproot from that. How we get round that if you're in wetter areas is actually establish it on your north and west facing slopes first because they'll be warmest and the water will move. It will actually drain through on clay soils that you might think I shouldn't ever be able to put lucerne on here. But as long as the water is moving, it's okay. If you put the lucerne on the valley floor and all the water comes to the valley floor and sits there, it'll kill it. But if you go on the toe slopes of a hill that you can, you know, on a, a sort of 10 degree contour, north and west facing slopes, which are the warmest, pretty much any soil type at this stage, I'd be saying, give it a go. Okay, perfect. That's actually answered a couple of questions that has come through. Nailed it. Um, <laughs> So, so I put you oh, off a bit because you were about to ask your next question and it disappears. <laughs> <laughs> um, so how does lucerne work with ryegrass pastures or is it best just to have a lucerne stand on its own? Lucerne stand by itself. Um, a lot of people have tried lucerne and grass mixtures and we've done a lot of lucerne grass mixtures at Lincoln because a lot of people tried it and we had to say whether it worked or not. We did lucerne coxfoot, we did lucerne brome. I don't, couldn't do lucerne fescue because I just couldn't bring myself to do it because their grazing management is so different that um, you end up having to get onto the lucerne too early with a lucerne um, uh, fescue mix. In all of those experiments, we've got five years worth of data. The first two years, we got similar live weight gain out of the lucerne and lucerne grass mixes. And that was because the lucerne grass mixes were still 80% lucerne. But as soon as the grass become dominant, we drop production off those stands by about 40%. So you can use lucerne in a multi-species mix if you want to, but then it's just a part of the legume component and it actually doesn't help. The problem with ryegrass is it's too aggressive at establishment, so you won't get any lucerne. It'll outcompete it. So generally people would try with a brome or a coxfoot, something that's much slower, if you've got a really windy environment, uh, people might put a little bit of coxfoot in to stop um, toad stalling or wind erosion. So I'm quite happy with that idea. But in general, you should try and establish a lucerne stand by itself and learn how to manage it. Which we'll learn next week. Perfect. So um, what sort of spraying regime do you recommend for direct drilling lucerne um, straight from pasture? So if possible, then, then it should have been autumn sprayed. Um, and the reason for that is that glyphosate is a translocatable herbicide. That means it moves around, translocate, move location. So um, if, it, if you can do that, then getting control of brown top and danthonia is best done in the autumn. And this last autumn was a pig. Because it's so dry, there's no point in spraying. Nothing, nothing would happen. But the ideal would be you might use... Um, something like Grand Star or Roundup in the autumn. And then if you, depending on how dry you are, but if you're in a really dry environment, you might then double spray. And so you spray again in the spring and then you direct drill. And that second spray just before you're drilling, you'd want to make sure you've got an insecticide in, particularly if you're direct drilling. Because that the, the direct drilling, you like to have spring tails. If you're in a wetter area, you'll have slugs and cutworms and all sorts of things down there. So that pre-emergent 
um, spray would be wanting to have an insecticide with it at the same time. So it just depends on how wet you are. Some people can take a pasture out in the spring, but I would always double spray. If it's pasture to lucerne, make sure you get control of the brown top. Really important. And so autumn is best to do that. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. You um, look at the question, I'll just follow up. So if I, was, <laughs> if I was doing it, if I was ideally doing it, I would spray the brown top in the autumn, maybe go through rye corn um, or Italian ryegrass or something, and you might even do that for two years, and then direct drill in your lucerne, rather than doing it just all in one year. So building on that, so like, what's the most common misconception with incorporating lucerne into the farming system? Is it around the establishment and weed control or? Um, no, the most common misconception is that I won't have any winter feed. And therefore I can't do lucerne in my system because I won't have any winter feed. And what people forget is that often it produces a surplus in the spring that you can make into hay or silage, or actually part of the process of going through, and there, here comes my please don't sow it in the autumn plea again, is put in the rye corn crop or put in the, um, put in the Italian rye grass and there's your winter feed. So that's the most common misconception. The other one is that it's hard. And actually, if you're good at establishing pastures, you've got, you'll be good at establishing lucerne. So you can do that equally as well. Just make sure you do do your weed control well. Um, so if you do establish and you've got weeds coming up, there are a number of chemicals that can be used to, to, to deal with it if you've cultivated. But if you've cultivated and used a pre-emergent spray, something like treflan, trifluralin, um, you should be able to get away without having to spray again in that first year. If it's going directly out of pasture, um, then you shouldn't really need to. You've done your weed control before you've direct drilled. And building on those weed control, um, what are your recommendations for annual weed sprays? Winter versus um, spring sprays, um, thistles, white days, et cetera. Yeah, so there's a number of, um, I just saw there's a question come through that I'll take first from Kate, which says, what if it's brown top, not brown top, it's something else. Um, it's the same principle. If you want to kill a grass, you've got to do it with something like Roundup that will get down into the root system and do it. From a, and once you've got a lucerne stand established, that's part of the management, we could pick up on a bit more detail next week, but um, the most common is paraquat and atrazine that are used. So something like paraquat is a contact killer. It's killing anything that's green in the winter. So about now or actually earlier would be a good time to have used it. Atrazine is um, got some kickback activity because it stays in the soil. So as the spring weeds start to germinate, then it actually gets absorbed by the roots and kills those seedlings as they start to emerge in the spring. If you don't get a chance to get on, and I know this isn't the case this year, but sometimes it's too wet to be able to spray in the winter. So then you might look to go, well, let's take the first graze and then do a clean up um, spray. And there's then a lot of chemicals around that can be used in the spring to, to deal with any weeds that might've come in. Particular weeds are difficult to deal with and you really need to talk to your local rep who's probably got more um, knowledge of individual weeds, yeah. Um, with that early establishment, back going back to establishment in spring, when is it a good time for it to, for that first graze? So, I, so there's two parts to that question. The first one is, if you do have some weeds come up and it gets to about 15 centimetres tall, you could just put a mob through and graze it off. Okay, you could just put them in and do that as your weed control rather than spray. Um, but the second and more common, if you've got good weed control, is to leave it until it flowers or buds up. So if you're establishing in October, November, you're really looking for it to get through to Christmas. And then actually I'd take that one as a hay crop or, a, or bale it um, if you can, because then you're taking any weeds that have come, you're taking them away and you've allowed it to get a bit more mature, which is what we're trying to do with that first crop. So just be patient. Remember, it looks slow when it starts because it's growing its roots about a centimetre a day down and it's growing about five tonnes of biomass below ground. So that's why it doesn't look like it's doing things very quickly and that's why it's important to make sure we do the weed control because it's preferentially growing its roots. Awesome. Um, have you... Uh, 
and have you seen and worked with establishing Lucerne on steep or medium hill country? Um, I have seen it over sown and um, it's, it's worked reasonably well in an over sowing situation. I've had, so it just, you know, it's not going to ever look as pretty as the nice um, cultivated soil that you've got in the valley or on the rolling hills, but yes, it has been over sown. It has all, whenever you over sow something like Lucy and you've got the same issues that you have with anything else, over sowing always has low establishment. If you get 10% of the plants established, you're doing well. So you've got to trample, you've got to do all those things we do for over sowing. Um, but I have had some examples where farmers, people have done ex-forestry blocks, um, old gorse blocks, and actually put lucerne into some areas that are pretty rough. So yes, I've seen it happen. And they're, they're then not looking for a be beautiful lucerne stand. They're just looking for some legume amongst their, um, their pastures. Yep. Important to graze, get seed soil contact. Um, if someone wants to contact me about that later, we can discuss that probably. It's probably more specialist. Okay. conversation yeah all good perfect um and also just to the attendees too we'll do about five more minutes of lucerne and then we'll get into the sub clover questions that have been coming through um so next question derek is are you going to get a better lucerne stand by working the ground first rather than direct drilling it uh it shouldn't make any difference if you've done it well so it really depends on what you're coming out, what your rotation is. I've seen very good direct drilled lucerne stands. Uh, most of Doug Avery's stands are direct drilled, especially if he's coming out of pasture. If he's coming out of a brassica crop or um, a barley crop, then he might cultivate. But th the key thing is having moisture and making sure that you, um, that you look after the weed control. So either is, I've seen very good stands out of both. I've seen some very poor stands out of both, and it's usually when the contract is in a hurry. And the biggest issue with direct drilling is people drill the seed and then they don't go back and get off the tractor in about two weeks and they go along and actually, oh, I've had cutworms or I've had slugs or I've had something. And it's not the lucerne, it's basically that they haven't done that follow up, which is really important. And that it's not just lucerne, it's any direct drilled pasture. Yep. Perhaps one other comment on the direct drilling though, Laura. I mentioned DAP, um, yes, diammonium yep. phosphate. And one of the reasons for mentioning diammonium phosphate is because it provides the phosphorus, but when we direct drill, we also don't get the mineralization of nitrogen. So there's no nitrogen available to the plant. So in that case, sometimes you might, particularly in a dry environment, um, I'm thinking Mackenzie country or where you are um, through central, you might use a little bit of DAP down the spout just to kick the seedling away to make sure it gets a good start. So, you know, 20 units of N, as DAP can be useful more in a direct drilling than a cultivated situation. Yep. Um, so can you follow an old lucerne stand with a new stand? And if not, how many years do you have to wait? Um, you can, but I've never been all that successful at it. Generally, there's enough um, weed in it that I have to take at least 12 months to get rid of the weeds. So if you've got yarrow, twitch, cooch, um, dandelions, then really it's the, it's about the weed control that's the most important. So I would be looking to take a stand out, um, maybe take it out in an autumn, go through a, a spring crop, a summer forage crop, another autumn crop, and then back in the following spring. So that's about 18 months out. But I, I know there are people that will just take it out and go back in the following spring. The risk is that you're, you haven't got good weed control. Yes. Um, cool. Well, we've got a few coming in more around the management side of Lucerne, so I might just park them for next week. Um, and then if there's no more ones about establishment coming in now, we might just move on to sub clover. Cool. Rightio. Sorry, I've just got to try find my place again because they're all mucked up. Um, so what pasture species, so this is going on to subclover, so what pasture species should we be looking at putting into complement subclover? Do we target spring or summer growth with the other species? Okay, so really good question. We did a, a nine year experiment at Lincoln and we um, used coxfoot and ryegrass, subclover, white clover and a number of other um, clovers. 
And the most successful pasture we had was Coxfoot with subclover. And we autumn sowed them um, because the, the, the Coxfoot's quite slow, but the, the combination of those two species worked really well because the subclover gave us a lot of feed in the spring. We could set stock, we could hammer it, and then subclover is an annual, so it dies. Now, when it dies, it releases some nitrogen. And it will have, if we've grown three tonne of subclover, we've fixed 75 kgs of N, 25 kgs of N per tonne of legume that we grow. Now, that nitrogen became available for the coxfoot, and then the coxfoot became palatable. Because one of the issues people have with coxfoot is it outcompetes everything, and you end up with unpalatable coxfoot because it, it keeps low nitrogen. So the animals don't want to eat it. So that combination worked really well for us, uh, much better even than subclover with ryegrass, because the ryegrass um, died out after about three years, disappeared off the, the face. Um, and so, you know, subclover with that complementarity means the subclover grew early, then the coxfoot comes in, we've, the subclover's died, we get a little bit of summer rain, the nitrogen gets available to the coxfoot. Coxfoot is our most active grass in the summer, much more active than ryegrass, will respond much quicker to um, rainfall than ryegrass will, and it's persistent. So at the end of nine years, we still had 60% of that stand was coxfoot. And if I'd been in a commercial situation, I probably would have at that point gone back in and drilled subclover again. The subclover numbers were starting to die, the coxfoot was getting a bit um, strong, but the ryegrass had gone after five years. There was nothing left, we were down to 10%. So a lot of people hate coxfoot, but I actually, from our dry land perspective, if you're in a 450, 500 mil rainfall environment, it's your most persistent grass. And so it's then growing at a different time from when your subclover is growing. So having it at a different time is probably um, the best opportunity. Good. Um, so is the window for subclover seed germination greater in the North Island versus the South Island um, through to warmer autumns? Um, yes, it is, but it really depends on when you get rainfall in the autumn. So um, subclover is not perfect every year. We've just had a year where actually at Lincoln, my subclover's only just germinated. We've had a completely dry autumn. So I'm going to try and build cover with that subclover now to have some spring cover. Had it rained in March, it would have started growing in March, but it will grow me more in the North Island because it's warmer. But it, the, the key thing about it is the yield that you get in spring will depend on when that autumn break happened. When did I get autumn rainfall? And we all know that. We know that we didn't get an autumn break this year. And so it was late. But even now, subclover will be growing more than our grasses in any of our other legumes because it, it's still growing when the temperature's around five, six degrees. The other species of stock, they've said, no, nah, that's too cold for me. So the window is, you know, big in both islands, and but it really depends on when that autumn break occurs. And is subclover a one of the best ways to add resilience to dryland pastures, which are often suffer from summer drive at drum summer dry? And if not, how do I choose what species to use within the legume family? So the question is, um, what what do you mean by resilience? So if I talk resilience, what what we've tried to do in our dryland farming is say your most resilient species is lucerne. To complement the lucerne, you'd want to have subclover in the system. The resilience comes from having the subclover in the spring so that you can, for example, get rid of cull ewes and lambs so that you're getting stock off the property and allow um, that to allow that extra feed to be available for everything else. When it's dry, nothing grows. Coxfoot is our most resilient or persistent grass. Lucerne is our best dryland legume, subclover is second best, red clover, plantain, where it gets a bit wetter, you might do those. But um, they're a distant second and third, because if I can get a good lucerne stand, I should be getting five, seven, nine years out of it. A good red clover stand, I might get to four, but I usually might only end up with two. Subclover, if I manage it properly and build it up, I, 
probably don't have to do anything for 10 years. It will die every year, but if I manage that properly, and we'll talk management next week, then we're talking about just building up that subclover content once every 10 years. And it puts a big seed bank in the ground like gorse, and you've got these hard seed in the ground that then proliferate and grow for years afterwards. So if you're looking for resilience, the legumes lucerne first, subclover second, and from the grass perspective, coxfoot, potentially a brome, um, but the coxfoot will be a, your most persistent and resilient grass, not perennial ryegrass. I've just upset all the seeds people, but anyway. <laughs> I'm not a fan of perennial ryegrass in a dryland system. That's a conversation for another time with those seed reps there. <laughs> so how long does the seeding window for sub-clover last? Does it happen at exactly the same time every year? Or do you have to monitor for when it um, is trying to seed? And does it um, vary by variety? That's a really good question. So sub-clover um, will produce little flowers and you've got to know when those flowers come. And we're looking for you to allow that seed set to happen once every four or five years in a particular paddock. Um, and yes, it will come about the same time every year because it's based on the day length or the photo period. So it will start to come. Basically, as the days are getting shorter, it's never going to flower. And then as the days get longer, different cultivars can be early or late flowering. In New Zealand, we should be looking to put a mix of early and late flowering cultivars in together so that we've got the spread. What that means is if you get a really short spring, your early season one will have set seed and, and be good. And if you get a long and more prolonged spring, which because our spring is highly variable, then the later season one will have set seed. And over time, the environment will work out which one wins. So we tend to sow a mix of subclovers, three cultivars together with different flowering dates or different seed sizes, hard seedness, rather than an individual um, single cultivar of, of subclover. So I'd be putting two or three um, subclovers in a mix and I'd, if I'm sowing it and I'm looking at put about 10 kilos of seed in. It's a big seed, 10 times the size of white clover. So the equivalent of 10 kilos of sub seed is actually the same as one kilo of white. So we're really looking to make sure you've got plenty of seed in the ground. And you should be thinking about that now so that if you're going to drill or put it in next autumn, you've told your seed rep, because we've got to get it from other, um, other countries to do it. Okay, do you have any more? That was the end of our just subclover questions. We do have a few more general ones that I will ask. Do you have sure. any more comments about subclover before we just move on? Um, it's very underutilized and the part of that is we haven't really learnt the management of it, and we'll do that next week. But my key suggestion would be, when we had the North Canterbury drought for two or three years, you know, it was really getting hard for those farmers. I got some of them just to drill a big leaf like Wuginalip or Antas subclover, and then when the rain came, they actually had some decent feed. Their pastures were dead. They hadn't had any rain for three years. And it just gave them a boost and some really good quality feed the following autumn. So I think, I sort of look at subclover and going, if you can drill, contour drill around a hillside and it dries, you get two months of dry every year, you'd be a fool not to do it. It's a very low cost way of trying to get some legume into your system. And it's not that difficult to manage once you've got it. Okay, cool. Thank you very much for that. Um, so do you have any comments of mixtures to stabilise soil and avoid erosion in North Island high country? Um, if you're trying to stabilise soil, you need a mixture of deep-rooted species and grasses. Grasses will stabilise as much as possible, but really if you've got those sorts of issues, you've got to be thinking about, should I be putting some trees here? Should I be planting some poles? Um, so if that person wants to contact me, we'll probably do, do with that one. So I get some idea of where they are and what the steepness they're talking about. Is it wet or dry? Um, I'm happy to, for, for that person to email me and, and I'll deal with that one separately. Okay. Cool, thank you. Um, do you see a place for Persian clovers in South Island dry land pastures? Um, 
if you're looking for, so the, the, the person's asking about Persian clover and I've only talked about one annual. So when I'm talking sub clover, it's a winter annual, it's growing season is spring and then it dies. So Persian clover, balanza clover, arrow leaf clover, um, they're all what we call top flowering species. So what they do is they produce their seed at the top whereas sub clover buries its seed. And those species, you can use them if you've got a feed gap that you're looking to fill around November, December. But you really wouldn't be wanting to get them to try and set seed and come back the next year. You'd be using them as a specialist forage in a one-off hit. We haven't really worked out how to fit the Persians um, into our farm system. So it might be that we put them under a rape crop or we do something like that with them to get some high quality feed from a one hit in them. I haven't had much success, some of you farmers might have, at getting arrow leaf to reseed and come back, getting Persian to reseed and come back. It's quite soft seeded, which is why I've stuck with um, the lucerne and the, um, the sub clover in the main. I think they're the easiest and going to give us our, our, our greatest benefit. Okay. So um, I've got two more questions to ask. If you do have some more questions, um, could you please just email them to us or just put them in the chat box and we'll save the chat um, and try to get those answered for you um, in the attendance there. So two more questions to go and then we'll wrap up because we're just over time now. Um, do you have experience with tree lucerne and can it be more effective summer forage for hill country? Uh, yes, it can. So tree lucerne or tagasasti um, is one of those that could be used as a, a dry land erosion control that the other person was talking about, which is why I needed to work out whether they were in wet or dry. Um, so yes, and you, you sort of coppice tagasasti. What you do is you um, let it grow and then you, you can, in a real drought like we've just had, you'd actually cut it and allow it to, um, to, to fall on the ground and then the animals would come and eat it. The other thing is it's really good for providing um, winter forage for bees because it flowers very early. So bumblebees come and use it and um, it's very good if you've got any honeybees out that you want to give some feed to as well. So yeah, it's a, a really useful dryland plant. It's not gonna provide us with a lot of feed, but it would be very good for that erosion control the person was talking about earlier. And the one-off situations where every three or four years you're so dry that actually there's nothing to eat and then you can slash it down, the animals will go in and eat it and it'll grow back quite happily. So yeah, it could be used very much in a shelter sort of situation. Cool, and last question. So mixing multiple species is promoted by uh, people trying to sow seed and concepts. Um, can we get the required quality and quantity to achieve high growth rates uh, with these multiple species mixes? Uh, in general, it depends on how many species you have in a mix. In most cases, if you have um, a grass, a legume and a herb, that's about what you'll end up with. And anything else will end up being tall. And as soon as you've got tall herbage, you lose quality. So basically imagine a one story building versus a 10 story building. The 10 story building, you need more structure. Structure is lignin. So if you leave lots of species to grow very tall, you lose quality. What you're looking for is, um, as I showed with the lucerne, that's a really good example of about two and a half tons of dry matter taken down to about a ton of dry matter is the best you can do. Over time, a multi-species tends to, to, to um, self-thin and you end up with one species being about 70% of the um, combination, the second species being about 20% and all the rest make up the last 10. Um, in New Zealand, we've traditionally gone with a grass and a legume, but obviously we're using more um, herbs, plantain and, and chicory within those mixes as well. But really, once you go beyond that, and we've got a five-year study at Lincoln at the moment, and after about three years, we're down to two or three species being um, dominant. Thank you very much for the team. So we've got Natalie, Hugh, and of course, Derek and Maria. Can't forget about you behind the scenes. So thank you very much for, for tonight. Derek, do you have any last words around dryland pastures or any take home messages? Well, my take home message is I think it's an exciting space to be. And um, we've got the tools in the box already to really grow the dryland space. And I'm looking forward to a lot of people 
doing that. There's opportunity, we've got people that have done it that have been successful. They're more than willing to share their information and their knowledge. Um, perhaps my last take home might be, for those that are interested in the Lucerne, that Fraser Avery's got a field day on October the 16th because he won South Island um, Farmer of the Year. So if you're interested in how the legumes really work in a dry environment, that might be a good one to, to mark on the diary. Cool, and could be a bit of a fun adventure for the North Island people to come down to that, jump on the ferry and join us in the South.